Preface to the French and German Editions As was indicated in the Preface to the Russian Edition, this pamphlet was written in 1916 with an eye to the Tsarist censorship. I was unable to revise the whole text at the present time, nor, perhaps, would this be advisable, since the main purpose of the book was, and remains, to present, on the basis of the summarized returns of irrefutable bourgeois statistics and the admissions of bourgeois scholars of all countries, a composite picture of the world capitalist system in its international relationships at the beginning of the 20th century, on the eve of the First World Imperialist War. To a certain extent, it will even be useful for many communists in advanced capitalist countries to convince themselves by the example of this pamphlet, legal from the standpoint of the Tsarist censor, of the possibility and necessity of making use of even the slight remnants of legality which still remain at the disposal of the communists, say, in contemporary America or France, after the recent almost wholesale arrests of communists, in order to explain the utter falsity of social pacifist views and hopes for world democracy. The most essential of what should be added to this censored pamphlet I shall try to present in this preface. It is proved in the pamphlet that the War of 1914-18 to was imperialist, that is, an annexationist, predatory war of plunder. On the part of both sides, it was a war for the division of the world, for the partition and repartition of colonies and spheres of influence of finance capital, etc. Proof of what was the true social or rather the true class character of the war is naturally to be found not in the diplomatic history of the war, but in an analysis of the objective position of the ruling classes in all the belligerent countries. In order to depict this objective position, one must not take examples or isolated data in view of the extreme complexity of the phenomena of social life. It is always possible to select any number of examples or separate data to prove any proposition, but all the data on the basis of economic life in all the belligerent countries and the whole world. It is precisely irrefutable summarized data of this kind that I quoted in describing the partition of the world in 1876 and 1914, in Chapter 6, and the division of the world's railways in 1890 and 1913, in Chapter 7. Railways are a summation of the basic capitalist industries, coal, iron, and steel, a summation and the most striking index of the development of world trade and bourgeois democratic civilization. How the railways are linked up with large-scale industry, with monopolies, syndicates, cartels, trusts, banks, and the financial oligarchy is shown in the preceding chapters of the book. The uneven distribution of the railways, their uneven development, sums up, as it were, modern monopolist capitalism on a worldwide scale. And this summary proves that imperialist wars are absolutely inevitable under such an economic system as long as private property and the means of production exists. The building of railways seems to be a simple, natural, democratic, cultural, and civilizing enterprise. That is what it is in the opinion of the bourgeois professors who are paid to depict capitalist slavery in bright colors and in the opinion of petty bourgeois Philistines. But as a matter of fact, the capitalist threads, which in thousands of different intercrossings bind these enterprises with private property and the means of production in general, have converted this railway construction into an instrument for oppressing a thousand million people in the colonies and semi-colonies, that is, more than half the population of the globe that inhabits the dependent countries, as well as the wage slaves of capital in the civilized countries. Private property, based on the labor of the small proprietor, free competition, democracy, all the catchwords with which the capitalists and their press deceive the workers and the peasants, are things of the distant past. Capitalism has grown into a world system of colonial oppression and of the financial strangulation of the overwhelming majority of the population of the world by a handful of advanced countries. 
and this booty is shared between two or three powerful world plunderers armed to the teeth, America, Great Britain, Japan, who are drawing the whole world into their war over the division of their booty. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, dictated by monarchist Germany, and the subsequent much more brutal and despicable Treaty of Versailles, dictated by the Democratic Republics of America and France, and also by Free Britain, have rendered a most useful service to humanity by exposing both imperialism's hired coolies of the pen and petty bourgeois reactionaries who, although they call themselves pacifist and socialists, sang praises to Wilsonism and insisted that peace and reforms were possible under imperialism. The tens of millions of dead and maimed left by the war, a war to decide whether the British or German group of financial plunderers is to receive the most booty, and those two peace treaties are with unprecedented rapidity opening the eyes of the millions and tens of millions of people who are downtrodden, oppressed, deceived, and duped by the bourgeoisie. Thus, out of the universal ruin caused by the war, a worldwide revolutionary crisis is arising which, however prolonged and arduous its stages might be, cannot end otherwise than in a proletarian revolution and in its victory. The Basel Manifesto of the Second International, which in 1912 gave an appraisal of the very war that broke out in 1914, and not of war in general, there are different kinds of wars, including revolutionary wars, this manifesto is now a monument exposing to the full the shameful bankruptcy and treachery of the heroes of the Second International. That is why I reproduce this manifesto as a supplement to the present edition, and again and again I urge the reader to note that the heroes of the Second International are as assiduously avoiding the passages of this manifesto which speak precisely, clearly and definitely, of the connection between the impending war and the proletarian revolution as a thief avoids the scene of a crime. Special attention has been devoted in this pamphlet to a criticism of Kautskyism, the international ideological trend represented in all countries of the world by the most prominent theoreticians, the leaders of the Second International, Otto Bauer and Co. in Austria, Ramsay MacDonald and others in Britain, Albert Thomas in France, etc., etc., and a multitude of socialists, reformists, pacifists, bourgeois democrats, and parsons. This ideological trend is, on the one hand, a product of the disintegration and decay of the Second International, and on the other hand, the inevitable fruit of the ideology of the petty bourgeoisie, whose entire way of life holds them captive to bourgeois and democratic prejudices. The views held by Kautsky and his like are a complete renunciation of those same revolutionary principles of Marxism that writer has championed for decades, especially, by the way, in his struggle against socialist opportunism of Bernstein, Millerand, Hindman, Gompers, etc. It is not a mere accident, therefore, that Kautsky's followers all over the world have now united in practical politics with the extreme opportunists through the Second or Yellow International, and with the bourgeois governments through bourgeois coalition governments in which socialists take part. The growing world proletarian revolutionary movement in general, and the communist movement in particular, cannot dispense with an analysis and exposure of the theoretical errors of Kautskyism. The more so since pacifism and democracy in general, which lay no claim to Marxism whatever, but which, like Kautsky and co., are obscuring the profundity of the contradictions of imperialism and the inevitable revolutionary crisis to which it gives rise, are still very widespread all over the world. To combat these tendencies is the bounden duty of the party of the proletariat, which must win away from the bourgeoisie the small proprietors who are duped by them and the millions of working people who enjoy more or less petty bourgeois conditions of life. A few words must be said about Chapter 8, Parasitism and Decay of Capitalism, as already pointed out in the text, Hilferding, ex-Marxist, 
and now a comrade in arms of Kautsky and one of the chief exponents of bourgeois reformist policy in the independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, has taken a step backward on this question compared with the frankly pacifist and reformist Englishman Hobson. The international split of the entire working class movement is now quite evident, the second and the third internationals. The fact that armed struggle and civil war is now raging between the two trends is also evident. The support given to Kolchak and Denikin in Russia by the Menshevists and socialist revolutionaries against the Bolsheviks, the fights the Scheidemans and Nosks have conducted in conjunction with the bourgeoisie against the Spartacists in Germany, the same thing in Finland, Poland, Hungary, etc. What is the economic basis of this world historical phenomena? It is precisely the parasitism and decay of capitalism, characteristic of its highest historical stage of development, i.e. imperialism. As this pamphlet shows, capitalism has now singled out a handful, less than one-tenth of the inhabitants of the globe, less than one-fifth at the most generous and liberal calculation, of exceptionally rich and powerful states which plunder the whole world simply by clipping coupons. Capital exports yield an income of 8 to 10,000 million francs per annum at pre-war prices and according to pre-war bourgeois statistics. Now, of course, they yield much more. Obviously, out of such enormous super profits, since they are obtained over and above the profits which capitalists squeeze out of their workers of their own country, it is possible to bribe the labor leaders and the upper stratum of the labor aristocracy. And that is just what the capitalists of the advanced countries are doing. They are bribing them in a thousand different ways, direct and indirect, overt and covert. This stratum of workers turned bourgeois or the labor aristocracy, who are quite Philistine in their mode of life, in the size of their earnings and in their entire outlook, is the principal prop of the Second International, and in our days, the principal social, not military prop of the bourgeoisie. For they are the real agents of the bourgeoisie in the working class movement, the labor lieutenants of the capitalist class, real vehicles of reformism and chauvinism. In the civil war between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, they inevitably and in no small numbers take the side of the bourgeoisie, the Versailles, against the communards. Unless the economic roots of this phenomenon are understood and its political and social significance is appreciated, not a step can be taken toward the solution of the practical problem of the communist movement and of the impending social revolution. Imperialism is the eve of the social revolution of the proletariat. This has been confirmed since 1917 on a worldwide scale. N. Lenin, July 6, 1920 During the last 15 to 20 years, especially since the Spanish-American War, 1898, and the Anglo-Boer War, 1899 to 1902, the economic and also the political literature of the two hemispheres has more and more often adopted the term imperialism in order to describe the present era. In 1902, a book by the English economist J.A. Hobson, Imperialism, was published in London and New York. This author, whose point of view is that of bourgeois social reformism and pacifism which, in essence, is identical with the present point of view of the ex-Marxist Karl Kautsky, gives a very good and comprehensive description of the principal specific economic and political features of imperialism. In 1910, there appeared in Vienna the work of the Austrian Marxist Rudolf Hilferding, Finance Capital, Russian Edition, Moscow, 1912. In spite of the mistake the author makes on the theory of money, and in spite of a certain inclination on his part to reconcile Marxism with opportunism, this work gives a very valuable theoretical analysis of the latest phase of capitalist development, as the subtitle runs. Indeed, what has been said of imperialism during the last few years, especially in an enormous number of magazine and newspaper articles, and also in the resolutions, for example, of the Chemnitz and Basel Congresses, which took place in the autumn of 1912, 
has scarcely gone beyond the ideas expounded, or more exactly, summed up by the two writers mentioned above. Later on, I shall try to show briefly, and as simply as possible, the connection and relationship between the principal economic features of imperialism. I shall not be able to deal with the non-economic aspects of the question, however much they deserve to be dealt with. References to literature and other notes which, perhaps, would not interest all readers are to be found at the end of this pamphlet.